Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Business Flows Reference Models Best Practice with Signavio by BP Experts. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Neve. I work in marketing at Signavio and I'm happy to be your host and moderator today. So before we move on with our presentation, I'd like to give you a short overview of the program. Your presenter will be Dr. Russell Gomersall. He's a partner at BP Experts. He has prepared a very interesting presentation on business flows and reference models, which will include selected business scenarios and processes. So a little bit about Russell. Um, he studied chemistry at the University of Hanover, where he became involved in interdisciplinary activities focusing on the monitoring and automation of biochemical analytics and production processes through the means of computer technology. After completing his PhD thesis, he started working in process and IT consulting. The focus there was on optimization of production processes with best of breed MES and planning systems. He has been constantly driving transformation initiatives in various industries, manufacturing, pharmaceutical and chemical including biotechnology to name a few. And since 2014, he's been a partner at Business Process Experts GmbH. So just to let you know as always, we've allocated some time at the end of the webinar for questions, but you can post your questions at any time throughout the presentation via the chat function on your control panel. If we do not get around to your question today, or if you would like more detailed information, our contact details will be displayed at the end of the webinar. So just to answer one question that often comes up, this webinar is being recorded, and you will receive the recording by email to watch at your own convenience. Okay, then that's all from me. I'd like to pass it over to you, Russell. I hope you enjoy the webinar today, and I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you, Neem. Thank you for the introduction. And yes, I'd like also to say welcome uh, to this webinar session, where I have the opportunity to uh, present uh, Business Flows, our reference uh, model. And uh, during the next, uh, say, half an hour, I want to just give a, a short introduction concerning the motivation for us to actually kind of establish and, and bring together business flows. Um, I want to kind of then cover the actual the characteristics of business flows, so how is it actually kind of like set up, and typical uh, use cases where business flows, from our perspective, can be used in, in, your, um, in typical business transformation initiatives. And then I would like to switch directly to actually um, show you um, some of the content, so do a kind of like a walkthrough. Um, do, during this, I'll kind of like explain the architecture, so going the top-down approach from the end-to-end -end domains over the scenarios to business processes, just kind of like do a walkthrough on some selected processes and um, then wrap up and then um, hopefully um, have some questions from your side which I can answer. Now, um, in the introduction, uh, Neem said that uh, I, I've gone a long way with processes and uh, say coming from studying chemistry where also models, but very different models are of course are of relevance. Um, I in the last uh, uh, couple of years have been uh, deeply involved with business process management. Uh, the background of our company is that we uh, were founded as a company um, as a spin-off of IdeaShare Consulting. So, and during this time, of course, uh, process management, uh, methodologies, but also involvement in big transformation projects um, has always been the focus of this company. And uh, 2012, after, say, being sold to the software G, we kind of like created this spin-off business process experts. So we have a long, um, um, uh, say, track record on business transformations. And uh, now we are, as Signavio partner, uh, have a headquarter in Frankfurt uh, with three partners, something like 25 employees. We see ourselves as advisors, which help companies really build up their capabilities to execute business transformation initiatives. So our idea is that we act as business architects, helping the companies design their process and IT architecture and translate the business requirements into solutions. Um, we also see ourselves as a business coach, so where actually uh, a lot of companies struggle in actually taking their strategies down to an operational level. So this is kind of like the idea of actually helping them can let them fold their own powers to then um, create own operating models and implement them within their organization. And this typically also means that process management becomes a topic, process management in the sense that you have to establish certain roles and processes, um, but also a certain content in your organization. 
And in doing these, uh, these many projects we've been involved in, especially seeing ourselves as advisors, we always get encountered with the same questions. And these questions are, okay, we need to kind of enter this business transformation journey. We need to, say, establish process management in our organization. We need to establish a process repository. But how do we go about it? And here in the past, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, has been quite a significant development. Uh, I think that the business model of a lot of consulting companies in the past was actually to maybe even um, earn money developing uh, conventions, discussing methodologies, and uh, then maybe even entering an excessive process modeling initiative where after one to two years, um, maybe a repository was established. And I think that nowadays, um, the, the, the business is much faster. The expectations from businesses that are entering process management are that you are much faster in setting up the tool, you are much faster in setting up uh, the repository to actually kind of like then drive the transformation initiative. And so based on this, I think the developments in tools you see kind of like reflected that with Signav, you now have a, have a cloud solution where you can very easily kind of like on a very scalable model actually enter the topic um, process management. Very flexibly, you can kind of like enter this. But on the other hand, you still have a humongous um, amount of work and things to discuss within your organization concerning the content. So. Based on this, we were very often challenged with the, the question, so what, you've done this so and so many times, so why don't you kind of like bring your best practices in um, into the project? And this, in, in difference to, say, a lot of um, kind of like then just earning money by, by kind of like saying, yeah, we'll do the consulting and somewhere, somewhere hidden away we have our best practices, we said, okay, we want to kind of like make this tangible. We want to create a best practice, um, a best practice, sorry, a best practice contents which you can see up front where you can see clearly how the best practices are structured and we want to make it easy to access for you. So independent from your any decisions on tools, um, on the devices you're using, the systems you're using, you have an access to the content. And it should be simple to understand. It's not, not over-engineered but it has to be simple to understand, a simple architecture that is usable for your uh, for specific tra um, uh, transformation kind of use cases and on the other hand on the level of detail concerning the the actual content it is industry specific and it is specific so there is real content behind it so based on these kind of like uh, requirements um, we also look to the the use cases so where do we see that reference content really becomes becomes relevant so um, initially, I, I also mentioned that the main case is that you have a business transformation in, uh, um, initiative. You know that you need to um, describe and document your processes, um, but you don't have the time to actually kind of like elaborate on methodologies, on conventions, on building up enterprise landscapes. And here, references are always of a great help. They really accelerate. So having a process framework where from an architectural perspective, but also from a content perspective, you have something to kind of like reflect on. And then instead of kind of like modeling new, you just have kind of like uh, and adapt the model and maybe scope and adapt the models um, is something that uh, is of high, um, high relevance. And also in the industry we are actually um, uh, covering, so we're talking uh, mainly about um, say industrial organizations, something like chemical pharmaceuticals, manufacturing. Here in the bottom line the transformations always include also the implementation of or standardization of IT systems such as the SAP system. So here again from the, um, from the aspect that we wanted to cover is that we want to make these processes n nothing that are kind of like uh, or something that really are clearly related to the best practices of standard, standard C, um, um, SAP, so an ERP system. And, and here, so the granularity, but also kind of like the documentation of transactions fits to SAP so that when you enter into the process transformation discussion, that you then have a result which can actually be applied then to uh, later implementations in an IT environment such as SAP. But I think the use cases go far beyond this, especially if you make this, um, these, this content accessible to all. And we have a lot of use cases where actually you want to enter process workshops, but instead of kind of like going to a workshop to discuss something, um, say like uh, a quality management process, you don't want to go with a, a blank white paper. 
but to have something to kind of like reflect your processes against. You want to actually take some best practices. So how do other industries do it? How do, say, other systems cover this topic? That you have something with which you then can end the process workshop to, again, work more on actually adapting the differences and looking at, say, the... Um, um, and say where your uh, where your processes are specific, where they are different, and then working more on these details rather than actually elaborating from scratch a process. So coming to the architecture, at uh, the architecture of the um, of the um, of the process repository, and here we are talking about a process model that will cover uh, the scope of um, uh, large enterprises. Um, um, say pharmaceutical enterprises, we have the same architecture as in mid-sized companies, so our best practice um, says that you actually only really need three levels, and each level um, you, you always has, um, serves a specific kind of like need. So having kind of like uh, the domains is um, definitely a level where you say, okay, what is the content behind it, but it is a structuring element, which is also very important for allocating ownerships. We have the end-to-end -end business flows, which clearly represent the operating models that you have uh, in scope and in, uh, that in, in your company. And then on the kind of like third level, um, on the BPM 2.0 level, you have then the real details of the, um, of the actual um, business. And this is something also from our experience that setting up a clear architecture is really vital for your project. And a lot of customers entering business process management from scratch, they don't think so much about architecture, they don't think so much about, say, domains and, and landscapes, they really enter the, the, the detailed process modeling. And then um, after, say, kind of like a certain period of two, three months, they have a lot of processes, and then they have to start restructuring because they notice that they, have a, uh, that they, they, in, they are not consistent. So to be able to create a, a consistent process model that actually also is communicable to management, you need to have a clear architecture, you need to have a clear landscape, and then you can work on the details, so a top-down approach. And with business flows, you definitely get a predefined architecture. You can add levels if necessary. You can add scope. But definitely you have a clear guideline to a top-down approach without spending too much time, uh, wasted time, before you can actually then enter detailed discussions. So that's a quick thing. So I think now I would um, then actually just jump to show actually how we have this in Signavio. And this is one of the things, uh, one of the points I mentioned was easy to access. So when we actually entered this discussion on business flows and we started building up the content based on, on our best practices, we also thought about what kind of like, how can we kind of like present this content to, to end customers. And I did say we wanted to be tool independent. And we did then find after, say, experimenting with different platforms that Signavio has really um, that all the features that you need to be to, to give people a quick, fast access without it, them having to buy the tool. You can grant them access on a collaborative um, platform, but you can also kind of like use this to export uh, the processes in an XML file if they have other tools. So it really was the ideal platform suiting all the requirements we have for an easy access to process models. So then we took this decision then to actually bring the content into um, uh, the Signavio. And what I'm showing you now is actually um, an extract of the, uh, the, the complete repository just for this, um, this presentation. But here we have a very simple, clear structure on the folder side concerning the domains. And then as a top level um, entry map, we have then the end-to-end um, the -end domain map. So one of the specifics about business flows is that we really focus on the, the um, the end-to-end -end, um, uh, views and, and uh, scenarios and domains. So here, just have to switch the language. We have it in several languages as well, or German and English, at least. So what you see here now is then the the top-level domain landscape. And here we clearly uh, define the domains according to say kind of like a let's say a high-level score model uh, along the value chain. And here we then allocate the different domains within, uh, say, the core processes of an industrial um, organization. So here we have the design to deploy, uh, lead to opportunity, order to cash, after sales and services, forecast to plan, procure to pay, plan to produce, inbound to outbound, and then some, uh, say, like the account to reporting with the financial processes, inspect to quality, 
highly integrated with um, a lot of the uh, purchasing and order um, and the, the sales processes, the inspector quality um, scenarios, project to decommission, and last but not least, then the, the master data management where in an end-to-end -end perspective there is mainly the uh, master data um, uh, creation uh, uh, topics covered here which are also uh, to a certain extent highly integrated with others. So what, what do you need this landscape for? From our perspective it is really a clear kind of like high level uh, structuring of your processes and uh, definitely and this is something that we really laid, um, we think is very important. It's not just uh, using this structuring element to just kind of like um, have like a folder structure, but also to give it meaningful descriptions on what is actually in scope for this domain. And this is, a um, say, on this level, we also see the process owners should be um, announced or allocated. So for each of these then um, domains, we have then... Um, a set of end-to-end -end scenarios. So in the first model, and so on the first level, we just have um, um, a list of, um, in this case, order to cash scenarios, end-to-end -end scenarios. And here, this is something we, we think is, is really important, is really best practice, is to um, represent all the use cases or operational models that you have within your company. So for standard, uh, or say for product sales, you then have the typical, say, sales of um, stock products, but then you have the, the make to order, the assemble to order, procure to order, sales via subcontracting, intercompany replenishment, sales with down payments. So you have all variants, not hidden away on a detailed BPMN, but you kind of like play them up so they're visible for management on an end-to-end -end scenario map. So next to the typical product sales, we have then service sales, with different variants, collaborative sales, consignment sales, and customer returns, customer agreements, pre-sales, returnable packaging. So what you see here is a, a very extensive list of end-to-end of -end scenarios, and the idea here from the use cases, again, is to actually use this for actually scoping, to actually go into a discussion, a discussion uh, with your business, say, what are actually the use cases you want, maybe later an IT system or, you know, your business to fulfill. And on this level, together with the owners, you can then actually then um, kind of like describe what you really understand um, um, as what this actually scenario, actually the objective of this scenario is and uh, what the inputs and outputs are. What the, uh, and, and so kind of like really differentiating the different uh, business cases you have in your organization. So for us in, in, in uh, big transformation projects, when we start from scratch um, with our business flows, the main um, aspect is actually to say which domains are in scope and then within the domains to say which of these scenarios cover your operating models best so that we have then, based on the scoping, say a preset of kind of like processes to then focus on. Now based on this then, we can um, we go a level deeper, so we look into then the details of each scenario, and here also very on this level very simple. We list out a simple sequence of the processes that are involved with to execute this scenario. So here um, we also then have the um, the more extensive uh, descriptions of these scenarios, and here you see we then have a list of the process. So receive customer order and capture sales order data, check availability to promise at sales order entry, determine product price and sales conditions, so a sequence of processes. No BPMN, just a pure value chain, and here we also have then the interfaces to other domain scenarios, so like the inbound to outbound, outbound logistics. In the case of, for example, with this uh, sales of stock products, that after the delivery has been created, of course, outbound logistics has to do the picking, packing, and, and shipping of the product. And we also have in these end-to-end -end domains, although it's an order to cash, it's a sales end-to-end -end if you want, so we of course also have processes um, from different, say, kind of like functional areas that are listed here. So with these very, say, simple um, but uh, complete um, um, flows, um, and you will also kind of like could question about the interfaces. This is then the baseline for actually reflecting with the business in how far these processes are also kind of like uh, what the requirements are, 
um, in the company, how currently the IT systems cover these processes, um, and, and how far you have certain kind of like design guidelines, how you want to optimize each of these processes. So at least here then, based on the scoping of the scenarios and the check in how far these processes also fit to your uh, to the way you actually process this scenario, you then have a, a baseline of processes that you want to look at in detail. So here the, the, um, also what we think is a, an advantage of actually having a given structure that you can reflect against is a lot of discussions on granularity. The granularity on couldn't I kind of like summarize um, the um, uh, two of these processes into one? So the check availability to promise and the receive customer order, isn't that done automatically in one step? So here there's a lot of best practices of where we believe it makes sense to actually um, slice the, the processes into, into separate processes. So that's always is one big discussion. And one of the, say, criteria that we take is also looking at, say, standard, um, say, standard transactions of SAP. So typically you have, uh, you know, for creating a sales order, um, the, in the initial step you have, say, kind of like one main transaction. So around this main transaction then we have, say, kind of like clustered one process. And then uh, we also know that, say, the check availability to promise and sales order, a sales order entry is something that is kind of like triggered whilst you're actually saving the sales. Um, uh, order, but in itself it has its own complexity and its own interfaces, whereas we then say this has a known, uh, um, requires a known process. Now these are all things that you can change, definitely, but it gives you a guideline, a starting point to actually kind of like enter the discussion with your business on how processes are actually structured and um, established in your organization. And another um, point is that, um, of course, you can always discuss certain variants or the sequence, but in, in the first instance, we see this reference model for you to actually have a starting point. And it is, does not um, um, say kind of like uh, take, um, doesn't want to necessarily cover every aspect, but it wants to say have the 80 to 90 percent coverage of the processes that you have in this scenario. And definitely you could always discuss about the sequence or if they're in parallel or if they're optional, all these kind of details. But these are things we think are customer specific. That's really the level that you want to start entering your discussion and adapting these reference models um, to, to meet your um, uh, requirements. So then if we um, then go down a level detail and then we're on to the, the, the detail level um, of, of the BPMN, um, this is where um, I think uh, coming from the architecture, I think one thing is then uh, secured is that you, you, you receive kind of like a, a nice granularity of processes the way in BPMN where you can even model them that you can print them out onto one page. Now that sounds like a, a stupid criteria, but just um, I mean the, over the years we've seen so many processes where whole scenarios were modeled in, in BPMN or in EPCs. And, and really nobody could really, really understand them. So I think breaking down processes, having more granularity kind of like on the level of, of the, the scenarios and then having clearly understandable uh, BPMNs, uh, this is really important. In our reference model, we have stuck really, um, uh, to, to really kind of like um, uh, a very simple notation. So this is also something you can use as a guideline. Of course, customers will extend it uh, on, uh, for certain kind of like requirements. But here again, we always say challenge, who is this process model for? He has to understand it. If he requires more, then that's good. If it's simpler, then certainly there will be have, um, have a better understanding of a possibility of actually um, reading it. So here we have typically the, the main function st steps. We have the interfaces to other processes. We have the typical decision points. We typically try to cover the most relevant decision points, but not every exception within this process is handled on. And of course, the, the most important, um, say, input and outputs, and of course, covered with this with the lanes, then the um, the actual um, then the, um, the the roles that are actually um, involved. So here in the uh, this is something uh, we like really much about the the Signavio collaboration uh, feature here is that next to the diagram, of course, we think these overview um, tabs are, are really 
uh, really valuable because they really kind of like show this process in which scenarios does it occur so it's kind of like the, the relation model you can see you can see which summarize which activities are actually included here uh, which you can then also relate to the standard SAP transactions you can see the interfaces which dictionary items have been used and of course and this is something we have in our um, description of the processes the business rules uh, or advice concerning business rules, uh, the description, the outcome, uh, if it's quality relevant, for example, and, and the scope. So um, this is also one thing we think is very important and we want to deliver with the uh, reference content is it's not all about just the models and the steps of activities. It's also a lot about um, the descriptions and the roles and maybe even the risks or um, associated elements um, that have to also be documented within your process repository. Okay, so um, this was just a, a quick walkthrough of, um, say, a, a one drill down. Maybe just to show you, say, uh, another... Um, and I think with the, um, with the example we had, that was quite a, a straightforward order to cash one. So again, for these domains, and I'll go into say something like uh, procure to pay, just to show you another example on, on how here, again, with the same logic, we have typical mature, uh, material procurement where we differentiate between the supply chain materials that then have some inbound uh, logistics interfaces because they are, they are put on stock. Uh, we have consumables. Uh, we have um, assets, we have uh, com uh, maybe some comp spe specific end-to-end -end scenarios uh, where consumables are, are procured via catalog and um, service procurement scenarios, vendor consignments, third-party procurements, subcontracting with own components, so even specific um, subcontracting scenarios where, for example, for a production process, a certain step where the components are provided to a subcontractor, he then actually reworks them and then sends them back, where we have quite complex um, use cases modeled for you to actually kind of like um, also reflect the way this is handled uh, within your organization. So here then you see again uh, the sequence, what has been additionally um, modeled here are the, um, the actual kind of like say the more or less the group, the organizational group that is responsible for uh, for this process and here typically send then all the, the interfaces to uh, the um, integrated scenarios. So then you have here a complete overview even of um, um, complex um, scenarios. So what I want to say, um, I want to explain is that it's not just a, a trivial uh, representation of an architecture with some examples. But what we are really uh, are working on, and of course that's a, a never-ending story, is really working on the completeness of this um, of of the scope of business flow. So we are kind of like coming out with regular releases, where, for example, then uh, currently we kind of like stocking up on the after sales and services um, scenarios, uh, but also from a methodology perspective, now introducing elements say like uh, like value flows or or risks uh, for ISO certifications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was, um, as I said, a brief overview of um, a business flows as a um, as a as a as a, um, a, a content package, uh, which we make available um, over Signavio, and um, I explained the use cases, and we've been now uh, developing this for um, the last uh, two and a half years, and uh, coming up to now to the to the second release, and. Um, I think I had that. So um, actually, just looking at the time, yeah, I've, I've covered about half an hour. Um, I, I'd really uh, love to get, have feedback from you. Um, definitely what we also offer is uh, to have um, give you kind of like grant you kind of like uh, to a selected amount of the processes. Um, we we uh, like to grant you access to this so you can actually, um, actually see the content uh, yourself. Our experience shows that there are a lot of other competitors that uh, claim or say they or they have content, but you will hardly ever 
um, have the possibility to really kind of like validate it before you actually maybe buy it or maybe kind of like getting access to it. So what we want to really kind of like propose is uh, to, for, for people to check out the architecture, to see how it fits, to really think about how this can help them if they engage in a project with Signavio, how this can accelerate their, um, their engagement. And we are uh, really open and free to, to answer any questions uh, concerning uh, your business transformation and how you could use this in your specific case. So I'll hand over to you, Neem. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll be really glad to, to answer any questions. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you, Russell. We have received a few questions um, and we'll go through them now. So some of them are very specific to um, when you're actually in the tool in the presentation. So this is the first one. Let's assume you have regional variants, for example, O to C scenario for Europe versus O to C scenario for the US. Do you identify in that case these two scenarios in the order to cash map or in one of the order to cash boxes? Um, yes. Uh, typically, when we, when we enter these, these template discussions, we would uh, first of all define them the template um, order to cash scenario. And if um, a country variant appears during, a, for example, a rollout, we would then try to identify what the actual difference is. And here, um, I think it's uh, really important to say, um, is this really a variant or is it a different end-to-end -end scenario? And uh, for both cases, I would um, definitely create a variant, but I think it would still be important to um, to kind of like identify and then in the name of the scenario make clear this is an own business scenario. Um, so it is a really an own use case that they have in America, or they just process this um, slightly different. And then I would challenge why they do this differently um, in, in the course of the standardization. This could be kind of like maybe legal uh, requirements, but if it turns out that they just have one uh, process, so on this kind of like process sequence level that they just have a variant there, um, then I would um, definitely not include it into the template, but that I would have then a, um, a country-specific variant that I would then actually um, model on a country, actually a country-specific model. So I think that's a separate topic is how you actually use process models in rollout um, um, rollout projects and how you actually kind of like dedicated um, do a dedicated scoping for country and how you then model and identify uh, local variants um, and uh, model this in Signavio. So this would actually be a, a separate session, but um, I hope that uh, answers the question uh, question adequately. Okay, great. Um, so there's actually also a question relating to that same slide. Um, it's, can we rearrange or the order of these boxes? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the idea with the uh, with this with this with this reference content is that um, if you want to kind of like uh, use this, you can have either let's say a read-only access and you just kind of use it to then uh, reflect and then build up your own enterprise um, landscape or you kind of like request to import it into your environment and then you are completely free to delete processes, rearrange them and, 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 and build in optional phases or whatever. So, so yeah, then, then it's kind of like completely free. It's just a template if you want to see. Okay, brilliant. And um, there's another uh, tool question as well. What are the yellow boxes? Are they organizational units? They are more or less organizational units. I say more or less because it definitely they do not represent your organization. And I think in, in, in process models, it's always very hard to then, uh, it, it doesn't, or it doesn't necessarily make sense. If you build up a template, you want to have um, I will say an organizational slash functional allocation of this process. So, so like a like a um, so you can allocate the ownership of this, um, and and typically you would have uh, these processes then also included um, in the ownership of, for example, of uh, finance and controlling or the accounting to reporting owner. Um, but it's, it's so it's not a one to one an organizational. Um, um, uh, block, but it's, it's to kind of like, um, let's say, kind of like located in the direction of the organizational functional um, ownership. 
Okay, great. And um, then we have another um, more general question. Are HR, HMC processes covered? Um, currently, human resource or human capital management processes aren't um, so much in focus with us. Um, the reason is we think that the, the beef of um, industries that we uh, typically uh, interact with is, are within the, let's say, core processes, so um, especially around the highly integrative processes and scenarios around uh, the logistics and sales and procurement. Um, so here, um, up to now, we, have, we don't cover um, certain domains such as HR in, in, our, in our reference content. I mean, I'm sure that they, the architecture um, basically uh, fits, but um, we just don't have it in our content currently. Okay, great. Uh, then I have another question as well. Uh, do you use Signavio to track the requirements as well? We do. When we are in the project, we um, also track requirements in Signavio. Yeah. So it's something that we wouldn't uh, handle outside and definitely um, we then also kind of like during the project, we capture the requirements and then also have them um, allocated to, and this is also always a question on which level. So um, coming from a high level management aspect, we have certain kind of like value drivers that we have as requirements, um, which we attach more on the scenario level. And then on the process level, then we track then there the business requirements. Okay, perfect. And um, then just another question here. What kind of industries are covered? <coughs> we cover, I, I would say, every company that um, develops, produces, and sells products. Um, it doesn't matter if it's kind of, I mean, we come originally from chemical pharmaceuticals, but we're heavily engaged in automotive and manufacturing um, companies. And we've also been um, uh, challenged these, these processes for pure uh, to kind of like retailers that are actually just buying and selling products and don't really have any own product development and don't have any own production so here the scope clearly is different and they have some specific scenarios but um, everything um, say uh, industrial uh, we we cover uh, with our uh, with our content Perfect. Um, I have another question here as well. Uh, would it be possible to make any simulation about process performance between two process variants? A process simulation in the and, and what we typically do is if we have two process variants, then we do. Um, I mean, models are quite static, so we do kind of like process comparisons. To be able to simulate or use a simulator, you definitely have to add uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of additional, let's say, attributes to be able to simulate. So we have experience with simulating processes, and then definitely it's always interesting to play through different scenarios uh, or process variants and see what kind of like um, variants are more um, effective concerning this. But our content as it is could be used as a baseline, but definitely there's a, quite a lot of um, attributes for a real simulation that you would have to maintain, which we currently in our content haven't maintained. Okay, great. Um, what kind of license models do you have for business flows? So we, we have um, a range of um, uh, possibilities. So we have this kind of like a um, subscription kind of a model where we grant people um, let a read-only access to the model so they can use it for um, to, to reflect maybe their own processes or have like a library they can read into. And then we have a more buy model where um, companies can um, buy um, either from one model up to the kind of like the whole domains or the whole scope that they can buy the content and then have it imported into their into their environment. If it's Signavio or via XML into any other structure or even um, maybe into a solution manager structure, um, this, this is um, all possible. So we have a, quite a range of, of possibilities of providing um, this content as a, as a startup for, for the initiative. Okay, great. So this is the, the last question then for you, Russell. Um, how do you manage the life cycle of the diagram? Is it plugged on the, a validation workflow, for example, so that the diagram is first uh, in a draft version, then approved, and then published? Yes. 
we we use a workflow, a dedicated workflow, uh, where we then kind of like uh, when we're currently working on versions that we then via the workflow approve it and publish it. Great, um, that's perfect. So at this point, I would like to conclude the session. Thanks again, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Um, and once again, thank you to Russell for the presentation. Have a very nice day and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye.